In this series of videos, we're going to talk about bonds. Uh, bonds are often one of the more difficult concepts that we go over in an introductory accounting class. Um, and I just want to define a bond and then I'm going to walk you through an example of issuing a bond at a discount and, and how to work through a problem uh, in that area. So I, I think this Wikipedia definition is reasonable enough. It says in finance a bond is a debt security in which the authorized issuer owes the holders a debt and depending on the terms of the bond is obliged to pay interest uh, to use and or to repay the principal at a later date uh, termed maturity. A bond is a formal contract to repay borrowed money with interest at fixed intervals, semi-annual, annual, sometimes monthly. So in, in a, an accounting class when we're looking at bonds we're looking at it from the perspective of the issuer and what happens is we issue bonds to people and basically they're a piece of paper and they say we promise to pay you back money with interest on a certain date. Uh, and generally speaking, because bonds are long term in nature, you can have 10 year, 20 year, 100 year bonds. Uh, because they're not going to get their money back for 10, 20, 100 years, usually bonds will feature interest uh, paid typically every six months. Typically, there's a reason they listed semi annual first. That's, that's the most common uh, way to be paying back the interest. And, and that's the way we're going to do it in our examples. So our examples are all going to be. Uh, feature semi-annual interest payments but again you have to read it the question carefully to see uh, what kind of interest period you're up against so anyway we borrow money uh, we give them back a piece of paper almost like a note payable saying I promise to pay you back in 10 years 20 years 30 years plus in the meantime I'm gonna pay you interest every six months uh, so that's what a bond is from our perspective so let's jump into a question uh, the question says, on March 1st, 2012, XYZ company issues 10-year 7% bonds with a face value of $200,000. Because the market rate of interest is 8% on the date of issue, the bonds are issued at a discount. Now let's slow down for a second here. We issue bonds and we promise to pay back 7%. Uh, but unfortunately, well, not maybe unfortunately, but the, on the date we issue, uh, the market rate of interest is 8%. So we're issuing bonds for 7%. Our bondholders can get other competitively priced securities for 8%. Uh, uh, that's their sort of expected rate of return in the market. Our bonds aren't that attractive. And consequently, no one will buy them unless they're issued at a discount. And so people aren't going to pay us the full $200,000 for our bonds because, again, the interest rate is lower than the market rate of interest. Uh, and it says the bonds are quoted at 93.21. Now this number is a really key number when we talk about bonds. This is the percentage of what we're asking that we get. So we ask for $200,000, that's the face value of the bonds, we're only going to get 93.21% of the money. So if I go on uh, uh, and look up a couple of bond quotes, let's see. Um, bond Center on Yahoo Finance. Uh, let's find, uh, let's just kind of go quickly and look up a corporate bond. So if I look up, I, I, the one I, I highlighted here was JCPenney, you can see their bond quote right there under the price. They're going to get 94% of the face value of their bond. You can see this Ford Motor gets 102% of the face value of the bond, and you can see the coupons, their interest rate. So interestingly, Ford Motor is offering 7.7% .7 interest and JCPenney a little bit less, and you can see the bonds are fetching a little bit of different amounts. Um, I'll close that up. So in this case, we've asked for 200 grand, we're only going to get 93% of the money. So actually, let's figure out how much that is. Um, so let me just call up my calculator here. Uh, we wanted two hundred thousand dollars, but we only got ninety two ninety three point two one percent, so point nine three two one. We got one hundred eighty six thousand four hundred and twenty dollars. So why don't we do a journal entry here? I know it hasn't asked us for a journal entry. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I, I think we can do a journal entry. So I'm actually answering part B before I even go into the question, but why not? 
So let's ink this and it's March 1st, 2012. I issued $200,000 worth of bonds. I'm going to have to pay back $200,000, but I didn't get all the money because my, my interest rate is too low. I only got 93.21% of what I asked for, and we just calculated that as $186,420. So in this case, I debit cash for $186,420. I'm going to credit my bonds payable because i got to pay back the full amount. I'm going to leave room for another debit here. In 10 years, I'm going to have to pay back $200,000, and that leaves this point in the middle. I'm missing uh, $13,580 of debits to make this journal entry balance. Now, that debit, as I said in the question, uh, we issued this bond at a discount. And so that amount is our discount. We've said we wanted $200,000. That's the face value of our bond. That's the amount we're going to have to pay back. We only got paid $186,000. The $13,000 difference is our discount, and we'll debit the discount on the bond payable. So let's debit our discount. Okay, so we've recorded the issuance of the bond, and I just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, I'll reread the question. It says on March 1st, 2012, XYZ company issues 10 year 7% bonds with a face value of 200 grand. So in 10 years, I'm going to pay back $200,000. Because the market rate of interest is 8% on the date of issue, the bonds are issued at a discount. So again, I want to be clear here. I'm offering 7%. Customers or investors can get 8% in the market. They're obviously not going to want my bonds. They're not going to want to pay full price for them anyway. So they won't pay full price, uh, they will buy at a discount. Uh, it gives us the bond quote, and again, in Intro to Accounting, you'll be given the bond quote. If you're doing a corporate finance class, you actually have to learn how to derive those bond quotes, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Um, the bonds pay interest semi-annually, so every six months, that's what semi-annually means, on March 1st and September 1st of each year. The company uses the effective interest method, and I want to be clear about this. Uh, some texts will talk about the straight line method. IFRS and Canadian Gap uh, strongly, I think they actually make you use the effective interest rate method. They say, you know, you can only use the straight line method if it's not materially different than the uh, effective interest method, but uh, people have moved to this method, and, and that's the one I, I'm going to look at. I'm not going to do the straight line method for, for bond amortization. So or for discount amortization. The company's fiscal year end is December 31st. Now we haven't actually read the required. Required A, prepare an effective interest table for the first four periods of this bond issue. Okay, in my class I provide my students a table that looks just like this. I imagine if you've done effective interest table or effective interest rate method you'd see this in any textbook, something that looks like this and uh, uh, you certainly need to know how to fill one of these in to do the effective interest rate method. So that's going to be our next step. We're going to prepare an effective interest table for this bond. Now, as with all of my videos, right beneath the video, right under under here, uh, there's a link to both the table as well as the question that we're working on. Uh, but let's go ahead and start to fill out our table. Um, because it's semi-annual, the, the key dates are, are every six months, so March 1st, 2012 is our date of issuance. We're going to have September 1st, 2012, that's six months later. March 1st, 2013, six months later, and we'll do one more September 1st, 2013. And this bond would go on for 10 years, so 20 interest periods, because it's every six months. It's a 10-year bond, so I could fill down in Excel another, you know, till the end of time, but uh, we'll just do the first four periods here. Um, the interest payment is our first column we're going to look at, and the interest payment is what we've promised to pay. And if you recall, we promised to pay 7%, but because everything on this table is a, a semi-annual period, we want to divide that 7% by 2. The 7% is an annual interest rate. 
we promise to pay back 7% per year. And then whenever you see an interest rate, it's, it's typically going to be an annualized interest rate. So because that's an annual number, I take that 7% and I divide by 2. So 7% divided by 2 is, of course, 3.5%. And that's the number I've put in my uh, chart up there. And you can see 3.5% of maturity value. My interest expense is based on the market rate of interest, and I do much the same calculation. I say, well, it's 8% annual interest, but got to divide that by 2, and I'm going to plug in 4% here. Discount amortization or premium amortization, well, we're dealing with a discount. I'm going to just delete everything to do with premium because it's not a premium. And we talked about that. Uh, again, discount premium account balance, well, let's get rid of the word premium. Discount account balance, and there's a formula there. Bond carrying amount, blank minus D discount, blank plus D premium. Let's get rid of the premium. Now, the blank here is the uh, par value of our bond or the maturity value of our bond. It's basically the amount of money we were asking for and the amount that we're going to have to pay back. And in this case, we're going to have to pay back $200,000. So 200K minus D is the amount I put in there. All right. We're ready to go. We're ready to start filling this in. And in fact, once you've set this up, it's actually very easy and very mechanical to fill out the chart. So March 1st is our first date, uh, and it's the day we issue the bond. I don't make an interest payment on the day. I, if I borrow money, I don't start paying back on day one. So we're going to wait six months to make an interest payment. So in fact, interest payment, interest expense, and there's no discount amortization on day one. So I'm just going to black those out because we don't use those. There is a discount on day one, and we did a journal entry for the discount. We said our discount was $13,580 on day one. In other words, we asked for 200 We only got 93.21% of what we asked for. We only got 186.20, so there's a discount of 13580 on this bond. Oops, that's another question set. Um, in fact, why don't I close that one? Uh, so our discount is 13580 Uh, so our bond carrying amount, uh, you can see the formula there, 200,000 minus D. Well, 200,000, let's just put it in a cell, equals 200,000 minus 13,580, 186,420. In fact, the first line there is always going to be the amount of money that we got. I'm going to just uh, reformat these cells. There we are. Let's move on to the next period. Interest payment, 3.5% of maturity value. Okay, so my interest payment is going to be 3.5% times the maturity value, and that's what I have to pay back at the end of the bond, which was $200,000. 3.5%, $200,000 is $7,000. And this number is going to be $7,000 the whole way. My interest payment does not change. Uh, interest expense, 4% of the preceding bond carrying amount, so 4%. The preceding bond carrying amount, I look over my bond carrying amount, was 186,420, 4% of 186,420. Oops, I wanted there to be no decimals. Uh, let's get rid of the decimals. There we are, 7457. Uh, and again, my interest expense, 4% times 186,420 to get that number. Uh, discount amortization, B minus A. 74.57 minus 7,000 is 457 dollars, and basically here, if you get a negative number, you've done something wrong. And a lot of times on tests or on you know worksheets, students will get a negative number. It means they maybe they had a premium and they didn't realize it. They they screwed something up. You can't get a negative number here. Discount balance D minus C 13.580 minus 457 is 13.123. Bond carrying amount, 200000 minus the uh, common mistake here is to go 186 minus 13. No, no, no. Read the, read the formula there. 200000 minus the, so I'm going to go 200000 minus 13,123 is 186,877. I'm going to rinse, wash, and repeat here. I'm going to do the exact same process in the next row. Interest payment, 3.5% of maturity value. So I'm going to take equals 3.5% times 200,000, it's still 7,000, and in fact, that's going to be 7,000 until the end of time. Interest expense, 4% of the preceding bond carrying amount, so here I go, 4% times 
times the bond carrying amount and the preceding one was 186,877. I don't go back to the top, I just take the one from immediately before. Again, with the decimals, I don't know why. 74.75. So I take 74.75 minus the 7,000. This time my discount amortization is 4.75. My discount account balance, and whether I have a discount or premium here, I expect this number to get smaller every time. D minus C, I take 13.123 minus 4.75, 12.648. This number needs to get smaller every time. Bond carrying amount, whether I have a discount or premium, I expect it to get closer to my maturity value. And the idea here is in 10 years, in 20 interest periods, it should be just about bang on 200,000. It should just about hit the nail on the head. So 180, uh, sorry, I almost did that wrong. 200,000 minus D, 200,000 minus 12,648 is 187,352. I'll walk you through the computations one last time here. Again, 200,000 times 3.5% is 7,000, and that number is going to be the same until the end of my bond. 4% um, of the preceding bond carrying amount, 4% times 187,352. Uh, discount amortization, again, this, the decimals, that's so weird. Uh, 494, 7494 minus 7,000 is 494. Uh, discount account balance 12,648 minus 494, and last, uh, my bond carrying amount is 200,000 minus 12,154. Now, what you'd find is if you drag this down for 10 years, that's 20 periods, this number will get closer and closer to 200,000. At the end of the 20th period, if if it's been kind of calculated correctly or prepared correctly, you should be bang on 200,000. The reason is when you pay back. You don't pay back a discount. You have to pay back the full amount. So our discount is getting whittled down to nothing. So again, when we borrow the money, we borrowed it, and we we didn't get all the money. We had to sort of issue it at a discount. We asked for two hundred thousand. We only got one eighty six four twenty. When we pay back, though, we pay back the full two hundred thousand. This discount amount actually represents extra interest to us. If you think about it, we borrowed one eighty six four twenty. We're going to make interest payments every six months. But we're also going to pay back more than what we borrowed, and that extra amount represents extra interest on the bond. That thirteen thousand five eighty of, of discount is actually more interest to us. Now, the way we recognize it is slowly over time through this effective interest table. Um, okay, so let's let's start doing journal entries. Uh, so we've done the first. We did the journal entry for the issue of the bond. We said we got. 186,420 in cash. It was at a $13,580 discount, and we have a $200,000 bond payable. And we did the journal entry, and it's beautiful. Debit cash 186,420. Debit our discount. If it was a premium, we would credit it, and I'll, I'll do another uh, video with a premium situation. Uh, but you know, it's a debit for a discount, and we credit our bonds payable for 200,000. Now we're on to part C. Part C says record the uh, journal entry for the first semi-annual interest payment on September 1st, 2012. Now where's my pen? There it is. Let's go ahead and do that. So it's September 1st, 2012, and we've got to record our interest payment. How do I do it? Well, if I've done the table, easy peasy, here we go. There's the, the column for September 1st, 2012. Not the column, but the row. Uh, and we make a payment of $7,000. Well, when I make a payment, credit cash. Let's do that. Credit cash, 7000 bucks. And we're going to have a debit or two here. Certainly one. We're going to debit interest expense. You can see the next column is interest expense. Expenses always take a debit. This is no exception. Debit interest expense seventy four fifty seven. Now, if you're noticing this doesn't balance yet, we're missing a credit of four fifty seven. And what could that credit be? Well, next line over. Discount amortization four fifty seven. Now. In this situation, sorry about that. In this situation, we don't credit accumulated amortization or some sort of depreciation account. 
we actually just say our discount was on the books for 13580 but we want to reduce it remember our discount we're expecting to go oh dear down 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 and it's going to end up at zero after 10 years or after 20 semi-annual periods well we've got to reduce our discount so when I set up the discount I debit it now I want to reduce it I've got a credit so we're just gonna credit our discount and again if you want to be technical I think you might want to call this discount on bond payable you know and write out write it all out but I'm I like to use shorthand so there we have our second entry or our first interest payment debit interest expense credit the discount and credit the cash and again dead simple if you've done an effective interest table our next journal entries are not dead simple. They're, they're probably some of the more complex or, you know, just tricky, confusing that we'll do uh, all semester in this class. So it says uh, record the required year end adjusting journal entry. So our fiscal year end is December 31st, of course. And it says record the required adjusting journal entry. Well, I get the feeling, and again, this is December 31st, uh, 2012, just to be clear, because this is a multi year question. Uh, I get the feeling we want to use this effective interest table. Unfortunately, there's no December 31st, 2012 on here. The, the best we can do, we've already, if we kind of say we've used up this September 1st, 2012, which we have, we've already inputted that, and we've done a proper journal entry there. I'm gonna maybe brown it out or something, uh, just because we're not gonna reuse that. Uh, we're on to March 1st, 2013. Well, let's think about what's, what's included in the March 1st, 2013 line. In March 1st, 2013, it includes information from September 2012, because remember, it's six month period, October 2012, November 2012, let's scroll down a bit here, December 2012, January 2013, and February 2013. Of course, that brings us up to March 1st. We wouldn't count March because it's March 1st. So, four of these months actually relate to December 2012. Four out of the six months. So what I'm going to do on December 2012 is I'm going to take a lot of this information, well these three lines in particular, but I don't want the full amount, I want four sixths. So I'm going to take four sixths of this information and apply it to December 2012. Okay again I just want to revisit this confusing concept. This line, this March 1st, 2013 line that I've got highlighted there, actually encapsulates information for the last six months before it. So it encapsulates September 2012, because again, September 1st, 2012 is the six months before that. So September 2012, October, November, December 2012, those are four months in 2012, and then January and February 2013. Well, four of those six months apply to December 31st, 2012. So all I'm going to do is take that information and multiply by four sixths. So let's start with the interest expense. I'm going to debit interest expense. But not for the full amount. Now remember the full amount here is 74.75. I'm not going to debit it for the full 74.75. I'm going to debit it for 74.75 times four sixths. And just quickly using the calculator here, 74.75 times 4 divided by 6 is 49.83. And I'll just round to the dollar here. 49.83 is my interest expense. Now the next one will be just like the entry above to credit the discount. Because we're always amortizing that discount. And we're going to credit our discount for... 475, but not the full amount, four months out of it, four sixths. So 475 times four out of six. Sorry about my writing there, but hopefully you've heard me say it. 475 times four divided by six, 31, or 317. Um, okay, so 317. And last, I want to credit. Well, I credited cash before, 
But of course, it's December 31st. We don't pay cash until March 1st, right? Going back to the question, we pay cash every six months, and it says every March 1st and September 1st we want to pay cash. Well, we're not paying cash today then. So if I'm not paying cash, but I owe them some interest, this then logically represents interest payable. And the math here is going to be, well, I was going to pay them 7000 but no, four-sixths of 7000 was what I owe them. So 7,000 times 4 sixths and 7,000 times 4 divided by 6 is 4667 or I, I'm going to actually round the wrong way here to make my journal entry work. I'm going to say 4666. I hope you can see that the reason that I would have been off a dollar is just on rounding stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll say 4666. It's not the end of the world to be off a dollar. Um, Okay, so debit interest expense, credit or discount, credit or interest payable by 4666. Uh, that's the entry. Now, again, this is a very tricky entry, and, and it might be worth rewinding and revisiting and reviewing. It, it's where we have a, an interest payment or a fiscal year end falling between interest periods. And it happens all the time. It's, it's a bit of a pain in an accounting question, but we've dealt with it appropriately. Okay, one more set of journal entries. Uh, we're going to do journal entries for uh, the March 1st, 2013 payment. Let me just see if I can get a little more space. I'm going to tell this that we are doing uh, ledger paper. Nice. Look at all the space I just bought us. We're coming up against the paid bre page break there. Ooh. Well, now the question's stretched over. Anyway, let's do the March 1st, 2013 payment. Worry about that in a minute. Um, okay, so home. Oh no, I want pens. There we go. March 1st, 2013. Now, on March 1st, 2013, I'm still dealing with this highlighted row, but I'm not dealing with the four sixths. I've already dealt with that on December 31st, 2012. I'm dealing with the last two months. I'm dealing with January and February. I'm dealing with two sixths. So now I do a very similar journal entry to the one I did last time, except it's still the March 1st line that I'm looking at. I'm just going to take two sixths of that information. So, for example, my interest expense is not 74.75. It's going to be two sixths of 74.75. So, debit interest expense uh, 76.75 times two sixths and let's quickly oh not 76 75 sorry I misread the number there 74 75 Let me just fix that real quick 74 75 times two sixths is twenty four ninety two so our interest expense here is twenty four ninety two so far so good we're going to do our discount amortization. I'm going to leave room for a debit because I know another debit's coming, but I, I'm going to do my discount amortization. I'll credit my discount. And the amount was 475 times 2 out of 6. So, oh, almost dropped my mouse there. 475 times 2 sixths is 158. So let's fill in 158 there. Um, now the tricky part, and it's not even really that tricky. Going back to my effective interest rate table, it says I'm supposed to make $7,000 payments every March 1st, every September 1st. Well, on March 1st, I'm going to make a $7,000 payment. I'm not going to actually, you know, pay two-sixths of it, as I've been doing a lot of two-sixths here. I'm not going to pay two-sixths of it. I've got to pay seven grand. I've got to pay the full meal deal. So let's credit cash for the full $7,000 that i got to pay. And again, we're looking at this and saying to ourselves, well, wait, this journal entry does not balance. Well, why doesn't it balance? Well, anytime I make a payment, if I had a payable, if I had a liability, I got to get rid of the liability. I got to get rid of this interest payable. So we set up an interest payable. Now we're paying it off. Let's get rid of our interest payable, which was 4666. And what you find is when you do that, 
your debits equal your credits you have yourself a good journal entry now moving on from here any more journal entries here would be easy if you can deal with that going over the fiscal year end that's a bit of a pain in the neck our September 1st entry is just you know reading off the chart we would credit cash for 7,000 we would debit interest expense for 74.94 we would uh, of course credit our discount for 494 and we would kind of keep going on like that so I hope this has helped I, I know it's quite a technical video this one much more technical than a lot of the other ones and bonds are a technical topic and a challenging one and this is just the tip of the iceberg on bonds there's lots of other things early retirements and convertible bonds but I, I hope this has at least given you a taste for the effective interest rate method and dealing with a discount I'll do one more video very similar to this one on just how to deal with a premium and again we'll do very much the same techniques. That's all for this video and if you're interested click over the next video in the series will be on premiums.